Hello, everyone, and thank you all for being here today. We would like to start by thanking the Navy Child and Youth Education Services for making today's webinar on Chart Your Course for High School and Beyond possible. My name is Happy Garner, and I'm also joined with Katja Pinkston, also with MSEC today, as your webinar presenters. I am an Army spouse of 17 years, and I currently reside in Fort Riley, Kansas, with my soldier and family. My, I have four children, Hannah, who is in ninth grade, Grayson, who is in eighth grade, Emma's in fourth grade, and Ava is in second grade, and I've been a trainer with the Parent to Parent program for seven years. Katja? Hi, my name is Katja Pinkston. I have been around the military for many years, first as the spouse of an active duty soldier for 30 years, and now as a retired spouse. We are currently stationed in Germany, and we have a senior who attends the Dodia High School here, and I've been a trainer for the parent-to-parent -parent program for five years. So welcome to our webinar on Chart Your Course in High School and Beyond. Before we launch into this topic, let us take a moment to show you a short video that will tell you a bit about our organization and what we do. But before the video, I would like to mention we often sometimes get feedback on audio issues that occur during the webinar. If you're hearing us through your headset, you should be good to go on all of the audio for voice and video. If you're calling in on your phone, please know that the audio for the video will come through your computer and not your phone. If your system won't let you sign in to the audio through your computer or you can't hear sound through your headset, it is most likely because your internet connection doesn't have enough bandwidth to support the audio through your computer. Your best option to listen to the webinar live right now is to call in using your phone However, if you do not have the capability to hear all aspects of our presentation, know that you will receive a link shortly after the webinar that you can access at a later time to listen to both the voice and video audio for the entire presentation. If you have additional concerns or questions, please contact us in our chat box, which is in the bottom left-hand screen, and we will work to help you resolve it. The Military Child Education Coalition, also known as MSEC, is a nonprofit organization that partners with military installations and their surrounding school districts. MSEC exists to make sure that all military children have the best possible education through their transitions, through deployments, through whatever military children face. We want to make sure that the fact that their parents are in the military doesn't change a thing for them. Hey, I got a ride home. Did you have your helmet on? I don't. I didn't bring my helmet because I didn't even have a. Uh, I didn't have a bike, so there was no reason to have a helmet on. My husband's been in the military for 21 years. He's still active duty. Oh, this is from his Barnaby. All right. From well, when he's deployed, I feel kind of bad because you don't know when he's going to come back or when he's going to leave. It just happens out of nowhere. There are people who get to move in the summer, and that's awesome. And that would to me would be one of the best times to move. But um, when you get orders is when you move. I've been gone so much. I, I want some stability in her life and I don't want the constant moving around and changing schools. For my daddy, we always FaceTime and Skype. I cover my thumb up and then I just get it real close and then cover my thumb up, get it far away, and then I make weird faces. Caitlin's really resilient, but moving so much, it's hard. Before we made the decision to move, I looked into the school districts because I was really nervous. Like, Caitlin's education is very important to me. Do you need a snack? Yes, Mom. I'll take that string cheese and maybe something else. Okay. 
You want to know, are my kids going to be safe? Are they going to go to a good school? Where do I live so my kids can be in a good school? I love school. As an education organization, we focus in on academics and making sure our military students have the best education possible. We do newborns all the way up to college application process and financial aid. MSEC has a S2S program that is really good. If a new student comes to the school, then that S2S student will sit with that new student at lunch, show them around, help them out. In our student-to-student -student organizations, we ask them to go out beyond the walls of the schools and serve their community. They get to know the needs of their community, and while you're working alongside one another, you also build those deep, long-lasting relationships that we strive for in student-to-student, -student. and is one of our main principles. All right, you guys ready for one more story? <laughs> then we're going to do some Yes! Sounds good? Okay. In 2005, the Army contracted with MSEC to establish Parent to Parent. Parent to Parent allows us to give information and resources to parents as they navigate the education systems found here in the U.S. and throughout the world. We are teaching parents how to go home and help out their kids, whether it's reading, math, science. One of the programs is called Early Literacy. We pick books and then we build a theme around the books because reading's the key that opens every door. MSEC serves to serve the children of those who serve us. We have one overarching principle in our organization where no matter where you come from, what you look like, what you believe, you are 100% accepted. You know that, um... We can't bubble wrap our kids. I mean, as moms, that's what I want to do. I want to bubble wrap them every day before they go out the door. Stop, just stop but what we can do, it's like a rubber band. The military kid's like a rubber band. We can give them strategies and coping skills so that you can go on and, and do great things in life no matter where you've been stationed. MSEC is a nonprofit organization that promotes partnerships between military installations and their supporting school districts. The MSEC's focus is on transition and other educational issues related to the military connected child. We started offering our parent workshops in 2006. The purpose of the Parent to Parent program is to provide parents with resources and information to empower them in their role as an advocate for their children as they negotiate the complex and diverse educational systems found throughout the U.S. and the world. Today, you join more than 200,000 military-connected parents who have participated in these workshops worldwide since the program began. Most of the workshops happen in military communities. They're represented by teams that are made up of individuals with personal experience and professional training on moving, separation, and the reality of change for military children. So who are these trainers? They're military parents who have a wide range of experiences in college and life. They've moved multiple times in support of their military spouses. They've helped their children transition from one installation to another change schools an average of nine times before they finish high school, and much more. In short, they've been there, they've done it, and they've received professional training and research-based resources that they share with you. Now, a couple of administrative announcements before we go any further. First, after the webinar, you will be getting an invitation from us to take our online survey about today's webinar. We really would appreciate it if you took the two to three minutes it will require for you to give us your feedback. 
We want to know what you think about today's presentation and your thoughts about what you'd like to see in future trainings like this. This is the only way we have to gauge what you need. It is also a key method we have to tell the folks who fund our program what we are doing and it lets us know where we need to tweak things so we can continue offering the very best training opportunities possible for you, the military connected parents that we serve. So please take a moment when you get the email and tell us how we did. At the end of the webinar, we will remain on the site so you can ask any questions you may have. We'll unmute the webinar so you can speak to us directly afterwards. I do ask that when you're not speaking to please mute your microphones so we don't experience any noise or feedback from your system at, this time, at that time. You will see a box in the bottom left-hand corner of your screen where you can ask questions during our webinar. We have Tara Gleason with us today monitoring the chat box, so please feel free to utilize this feature. Also, after our webinar today, we will be providing you with a PDF file of resources and information relating to today's topic. As you logged in, you should have seen the resources. And as a final note, this webinar is being recorded. Our military lifestyle ensures that we will have many adventures that our fam families will move every two to three years. Today's webinar will focus on what we can do to help prepare our student for high school and beyond. Have you ever wondered the following? How many times should your student take the SAT or ACT? How many science classes should a mobile student who moves during high school take? Well, we're going to address these questions and more in our webinar. Before our webinar, we sent out some discussion questions that we plan to use during this webinar. One of the questions was, what are your concerns in terms of academics if your family moves during high school? We'd like to invite you to use the chat box and tell us what your concerns are. Our hope is that with all the information you receive today, your student will have options by the time they graduate, even if your family moves during high school. The information you will receive in the first segment of this session is important for two reasons. First, we will talk about the academic plan. By following the curriculum guidelines that we give you today, you will be ensuring that your student will be able to graduate on schedule even if you change schools during high school. Our second objective, we will talk about college readiness. The challenging curriculum that we recommend, along with other strategies we are going to share with you, will make sure that your student will have a strong application packet for college or for whatever path your student is going to take in the future. Our children will probably change school two to three times between the beginning of middle school and high school graduation. The fact is that we live in a very competitive world and having strong transcripts and leadership experience is going to benefit our students whether they are looking to go into the service, where it will assure they will get the branch and specialty they are seeking, or whether they are applying to a technical school or applying to a four-year college. So we will start with the first part and talk about what we can do to make sure that our middle schoolers and high schoolers stay on track even if we are moving several times before they graduate. So let's look at the chat box where some of you have shared with us some of the academic concerns that uh, you have if your family moves during high school. So I'm um, reading here the student falling behind, different curriculum, grading system is different, definitely. Um, concern that the student is not being able to graduate on time. We've got uh, weighted transfer credit evaluations between the districts. Yeah, and I think that is all of your questions. So again, thank you so much for sharing. These are all very important concerns that we will address during this webinar. 
Let me just address one of the comments, and that was the concern that the student will not be able to graduate on time. So I would like to mention the Military Interstate Compact that deals with our military connected children's rights. And this Interstate Compact on Educational Opportunity for Military Children helps states and districts address some of the key educational transition issue, issues that military families encounter. And these issues are especially the enrollment, placement, attendance, eligibility, and graduation. And uh, this interstate compact has now been voluntarily adopted by all 50 states, and it is, it is designed to improve the educational experiences of children of our active duty members of the uniformed services and National Guard and Reserve on active duty orders. And also the children of members or veterans who are medically discharged or retired for one year and children of members who died on active duty. So we are going to actually give a webinar on the Interstate Compact on July 12th. We are, we'll go into the specifics of the Interstate Compact and how it affects graduation. And as you can see, Tara has put the link in the chat box where you can check out some more details on the Interstate Compact. So one of the things we can do right now to make sure that our students stay on track is to have an academic plan. And we call this a six-year plan because MSEC has found that what students are doing in middle school directly impacts the student's ability to take the rigorous courses that we're recommending in high school. So at this point, we would like to ask for your input again. We would like to know your thoughts on the following question. How do you think an academic plan can benefit your student? Again, please use the chat box and tell us what you think. Since our six-year plan starts in middle school, so let's talk about middle school first. We would like you to keep in mind a few things about your students time in middle school. Middle school is really a great time to begin to plan your child's coursework for two years in advance. In many middle schools, your student can begin to take foreign languages, work on higher level math, or take earth sciences. These courses can open up a more rigorous coursework for the high school years. So. Sometimes parents are concerned that the more advanced classes will be too stressful. But remember that the school would not be inviting the students to take these classes if they were not capable. Taking challenging classes allows your student to learn to juggle the increased demands of these classes and to learn how to study prior to getting to high school when their grades begin to impact their college application. We recommend that middle schoolers practice good study habits. Students are dealing with six, seven, or more classes with different teachers. So they should have more homework. And they need to learn how to plan their study time and assignments to take into consideration both their schedule and their family's schedule. So it's a great time to instill routines and good time management skills. This includes scheduled homework time with the expectation that they have at least an hour of homework each day, if not more. Middle schoolers should be reading school material and practice skills every day, whether they say they have homework or not. If they are taking the rigorous curriculum we are talking about, they might be taking a foreign language or pre-algebra in seventh and eighth grade. So learning to study a little each day and keeping on task with their coursework sets our students up for success in high school. Middle school is also the time to learn to balance the academic with the extracurricular. Naturally, our young teenagers are often more focused on the social aspects. And the social and extracurricular activities are important, of course. 
Students gain experience and confidence if they participate in activities. And then they are more often more likely to try out or run for office in high school, which becomes an important part of their overall learning and development. Please make sure that your middle school student continues to read every day. So by the time our children enter middle school, they are reading to learn the material that are in those textbooks. But we should also continue to encourage them to read for pleasure. Reading not only helps with building vocabulary and improving writing skills, but also with increasing comprehension skills and focusing. As our students grow through this process, we can help them gain independence and at the same time offer them the support that they need. As you work with your student to chart their course for success, a world of opportunity will open up. Children live up or down to the expectations we set for them. Remember that you are your child's best guidance counselor. You know what they are capable of. You set the standards. Before we talk about our role as parents, just a quick caution. Don't forget that we are working toward a student who is fully responsible for their own education experience. And what that looks like in sixth grade when we're trying to lay that foundation and what it looks like along the way and when they finally get it, well, let's just say it's a gradual process. It's not going to happen overnight. The ultimate goal is independence, but they need our help along the way. And we as parents, we are an important part of this process. But let your child do as much as they are capable of and then step in when necessary. Particularly in high school, it's a good idea not to step in to work out every single problem for them because this is really the time to let them step up and be responsible for their own school experience and also to deal with those consequences. But at the same time, be there for them to talk things out and when necessary, help them about coming up with a plan that they can use to move forward with. Let's now talk about the circle of success. So we call this the circle of success for middle and high school students. The three areas that are important to success are academics, activities, and life skills. So let's look at academics first. We recommend that you encourage your student to take the most rigorous schedule that they can handle. This may be one honors class, or this may be four AP classes, and AP stands for those advanced placement classes. Again, you know your child best and what he can handle. Many studies show that rigorous courses produce the most successful students, and many of the instructors of those courses demand more from those students, which in turn develops skills that lead to success. And at the same time, the courses at the higher level usually are a little bit of a better quality all around. Students that challenge themselves in high school are typically better prepared and they're more likely to continue to strive in college. And these students are also more likely to graduate from college because they have already developed those important skills to be successful in college when they took those more difficult classes back in high school. While academics are at the core, the activities are also important. The activities and organizations that our students commit to during their middle school and high school years give them valuable opportunities and leadership experience that really prepares them for life and also employers and universities are looking at what activities the students are involved in. Therefore, please encourage your student to volunteer. Colleges look especially for community service. And it's also important for us mobile families to know that many high schools require a certain number of community service hours 
to graduate. So please make sure that your student documents or writes down their hours so that if the school they end up graduating from has this requirement, then they will have the volunteer hours that they need to graduate. It's also a good idea that students should have some portable activities such as Girl Scouts, Boy Scouts, sport teams, being part of the National Honor Society, because this gives them some activities to move with them when they are relocating to another school. Getting some leadership experience is also very valuable, and this can be done through positions of responsibilities, such as when they hold an office in a club or with an honor society or perhaps they're part of the student council or are um, having ROTC positions. So these kinds of activities show a college that students can balance a full academic schedule and the social life. They also show a commitment to their community and school. And colleges want students who will make their community a better place to live. So the third part of the circle are the life skills which our students will develop when they have to juggle those academics and those activities. These life skills include learning to prioritize, planning ahead, they have to get organized, and refine their study skills. So let us now talk about how we can ensure that our students graduate on time, even if we are moving during high school, and also what we can do so they have options at the end of high school. So when you look at the slide, you can see that we're comparing the graduation requirements in different locations to make a point that it really takes planning and guidance. We also want to make sure that you are aware that there are often two different levels of diplomas in many states. So there are the basic high school graduation diplomas, and often there are also the college-bound diplomas, or here with DODIA, they call them the honors diplomas. And here's one very, very important point. Especially those competitive colleges have their own requirements for their incoming freshmen. So in other words, your student may be able to get a high school diploma with taking, let's say, only three years of science. But many colleges want four years of science for their applicants. So please be sure that you're checking out those websites. So earlier we asked you how you think an academic plan can benefit your student. So let's take a moment and look at our chat box and see some of the comments you shared. We've got a plan helps keep my student on track. It gives my student goals to work towards, makes them competitive for college admissions. A plan helps when we move to a different school district. And then someone also said, a plan gets my student into the habit of planning for their own future. Thank you again for your input on this topic. And these are all very important reasons why it is a good idea to have an academic plan. MSEC researched the high school graduation requirements for all 50 states and DODEA to come up with a plan that would ensure an on-time graduation even with a move going into the senior high school year. In addition, if you follow these guidelines, your student will have a competitive college application packet. For any of those following subjects, we recommend as many honors, AP, or IB classes as possible for your student. With the IB classes, meaning the International Baccalaureate classes. And let's note some points for each subject as stated on your screen. In English, four credits are required, including literature and comp composition. For math, it's also recommended four credits. Statistics show that students who complete Algebra II are more likely to graduate from college in four years. Each additional year of math increases that percentage. 
four years of math does not include middle school math, even if the middle school says the classes will count towards graduation. Math is a sequential subject, so these middle school math classes will allow your child to take a more rigorous level of math once they are in high school. Don't worry that they will run out of math classes to take, for instance, if they start pre-algebra in the seventh or eighth grade. If your high school does not have AP calculus to take as a senior year, your child can take a college level math internet class or take an independent study or even go to the local community college. Using any of these options will show the college admissions office that the student has shown perseverance and persistence to take the most rigorous curriculum possible. In regards to science, Four credits are recommended, including three lab sciences. And lab sciences are classes such as biology, chemistry, or physics. And for social studies or social sciences, three credits are recommended to include U.S. and world history. Foreign language, two years of a foreign language as a minimum and it should be the same language, for example, Spanish 1, Spanish 2. For the advanced diploma, many states now require three years of a foreign language. Some school districts offer sign language, and it counts as a foreign language. And sign language is a great option for our tactile learners. Please note, though, that it isn't offered everywhere. Many schools will accept two years each of two different languages. So when working towards a Bachelor of Arts degree, many colleges will require a student to have taken three or four years of a language, and if they don't, they may have to take a language in college. Language is more difficult for some students, and if that is the case with your student, it would be better to finish the language requirement in high school since college-level language classes are faster paced and more challenging. Consider portable languages languages that will be available at your next duty station. For example, if you're stationed in Hawaii, Japanese may be available, but it's likely not to be available in Georgia. So keep in mind that Spanish is found everywhere and is the most common second language in this country and can be an asset when looking for employment. That does not mean students shouldn't explore other foreign languages. Taking classes through the local community college or through the local community language programs in places like Korea, Germany, or even Italy will certainly add to your students' experience. And last, we recommend at least one year of computer science. If your child is changing schools, we recommend that you get in touch with the new school as soon as possible to find out as many details as possible. Make an appointment to see the school's AP or IB coordinator before you visit the guidance counselor to set up the course schedule. And don't settle for a random pre-generated schedule. Select the classes individually. Another idea is to keep the time of day in mind when you're putting together a class schedule. If your child struggles in math, try your best to coordinate it as a morning class when they are fresh rather than after lunch. A great advantage with AP and IB classes is that they have a national curriculum, and the same curriculum is taught in every AP class, which may make it easier for students when they are changing schools, especially during the middle of the school year. So now let's talk about the second part, referring to college readiness. This section gives you a brief overview of how our academic plan helps support a student's post-secondary opportunities. If you're interested in more detailed information, there is a recording of our webinar titled College Application Process on the MSEC website. Not every student will attend college, but we would like to see every student who graduates have several options to choose as a path that is right for that student. Besides easy, easing transitions, the other important reason why we suggest that our students take a rigor, rigorous curriculum is because that is what universities are looking for in our students' application packets. When you look at the college admissions criteria, you see that academics play a big role, but it's not all about academics. 
Part of academics are a student's GPA or grade point average, class rank, and their SAT or ACT scores. And we'll talk about these tests a little later. But at this point, we would like to welcome you to chat or type in your thoughts about what you think the advantages are if your student takes the SAT or ACT or possibly both tests and take them more than one time. Students who have taken AP and IB classes demonstrate that they are able to handle a college level curriculum. Colleges know that these students Will, likely, will not likely need remedial classes when they start college, which saves the school and the parents some money. And an important note for us as parents, if your student successfully completes several AP classes, they may get credit for a semester of college without those college tuition payments. A few more notes about the AP classes. A student with A's in standard high school classes and a 3.5 GPA will not compete as well against a student with a 3.5 GPA who has taken the AP classes or more rigorous curriculum. At the end of the year, usually in May, it is important for students to take the AP exam and to score a 3, 4, or a 5. Though many high schools do not require the student to take the exam, colleges are increasingly questioning whether the AP classes are truly college level. And if the student passes the national exam, they have proven that they have the same knowledge as a college student who took that class. And here's another tip. When you are looking at AP classes your student is going to take, you can check with your school to see how many students took the AP exam the year before and how well they scored. This will give you a good idea whether it is a true AP class. It is also a factor you can look at when you're moving to a new area and searching for the right high school for your student. Colleges will not only look at overall grades, but also at whether students chose difficult courses, whether their grades improved during high school, and even if students let their senior grades slide. On the applications, they want to know what classes students are taking during their senior year, and they are looking for rigor. Students can't slide and take an easy last year because they may lose out on an admission to a student who has similar qualifications but has taken challenging courses throughout his or her senior year. You'll also see a piece of our pie here on the screen is diversity. What do you think of when you hear diversity? Many of you have probably guessed correctly thinking it refers to race, culture, or religion. And at the same time, colleges want to diversify their populations in many ways. This is the place where that journal your child has been keeping since sixth grade could help them express their diverse life they have led as a military-connected student. Just think what an impression it would make to an admissions committee when they see the student that has changed schools six times in 12 years but has still been a contributing member to each community through community service activities. Wouldn't you want that student in your university community? So where do our students highlight information about their diversity? in their essays. The essays are what make application packets stand out from all the rest. They should speak to who the student is and make the college want to have them as part of their community. Experiences and extracurricular activities. Colleges want to know what students have been doing and how successful they have been. We already talked about activities earlier when we suggested that students should create experiences by volunteering, joining clubs and other activities, and whenever possible, taking on some leadership roles. In case your student has a job while in high school, colleges understand that students who have jobs may have fewer extracurricular activities. Colleges are often looking at a student's commitment. This means that your student should pick an activity, if possible, at the beginning of high school and stay with it, 
instead of having a flurry of activities only during their junior or senior years. And lastly in our circle is connection. Does somebody in your family have a connection to a college or is an alumnus? This used to be called legacy. Nowadays, many colleges have taken the question about family members who attended the school off their application. Having a family member who is an alumnus won't hurt, but what is especially helpful is if you find another alumnus not related to you who is willing to put his or her reputation on the line to write a letter saying that you would be an asset to that university's community. This gives our military-connected kids an advantage because we simply get to know a lot of people, especially when we're moving from place to place and go out and participate in the community. Chances are that no matter where your student wants to go to school, there is someone you know who has gone there and could write your student a letter. We just talked about how academics play a big role in a part of academics, but another big part are test scores. So tests are a fact of life throughout our school careers, but two of the most important and to some of us perhaps the scariest tests are the SAT and the ACT. So the SAT measures verbal and math problem solving and analytic abilities. And the ACT or American College Testing Assessment is more content based. It measures the knowledge students should acquire during high school. Both tests are accepted by most colleges as part of their application process. So during our workshops, we often get the question, how many times should my student take the SAT or ACT? And there is really not a right answer that fits all of our students, but in general, most students benefit from taking these tests multiple times. So uh, let us take a look at the chat box where you have listed some of the advantages if your student is taking the SAT or ACT more than one time. So. Some schools super score the test score. We are going to talk about that. And colleges are going to give scholarships um, based on the SAT, ACT tests. Very true. And we have, they will get a better understanding of the content as well as improve their time management skills of the exam. That hopefully also increases their confidence along the process. And of course, they learn to deal with the pressure of time and yeah, getting familiar with the test. Again, thank you so much for your participation. These are all great reasons why students should take those tests several times. So as one of our participants already mentioned, some college, uh, some um, students, especially when they're taking the PSAT, they're going to get uh, scholarships. So, most students take that PSAT or the preliminary SAT, which is also called the National Merit Scholarship Qualifying Test during their freshman, sophomore, and during their junior year. But during the junior year, usually all, uh, only in the fall. And the PSAT is really a shorter version of the SAT. So if your student has the option of taking one of those PSATs, please let your student participate in those tests because it really gets them familiar with the test and it gives you an idea where they stand in comparison to other students and also where your students' strengths and weaknesses are. And this in turn helps you tailor your student studying. And what I already mentioned that what one of the participants said, some of those scores from the PSAT are used to give out scholarships. Please note that some colleges require additional SAT subject tests. So these subject tests are designed to measure your child's knowledge and skills in particular subject areas as well as their ability to apply that knowledge. 
So these SAT subject tests are typically about an hour long. They're mostly multiple choice tests in a specific subject. Many colleges require or recommend one or more of these tests for admission or placement purposes. And depending on what classes your student is taking during the year, that could mean that your freshman or 10th grader may already want to take one of those SAT subject tests at the end of the school year. Now, the full SAT test has changed recently, and the new test information is contained in our resource guide that is available to you for signing up for this webinar. And you have probably already seen that PDF resource when you registered. As we just mentioned, for most students, it is really usually best if they take that SAT or ACT more than one time in order to improve their score. So many colleges super score their test scores, which is really another very important reason to have the student take the test multiple times. And super scoring means that they will take the highest score from each test section of the verbal and math sections, and then they combine it to give your student the highest total possible score for that particular test. Please note that some colleges super score the SAT, but not the ACT, and then there are some colleges out there who do not super score at all. So here's an idea before your student applies find out how each college looks at those test scores. And again, you can usually find that information when you go on those colleges' websites. We also get a lot of questions about when students should start taking the SAT or the ACT. So we suggest that most students should start taking the full SAT or ACT in the early spring of their junior year. As we just discussed, most students benefit from taking that test at least two times, possibly three times. So make sure that they will have the chance to take those tests several times before they are a senior. At the same time, if you have a student who has a lot of test anxiety, for example, you may want to plan on your student taking the SAT or ACT even before they start their junior year just to take away some of that pressure. One of the most useful tips is to have your student start early in high school to study for these tests. So let's now talk about test prep. These are a few websites with free resources to help your student prepare for these exam. So the first one is I need a pencil has free SAT test prep and online study guides. It also has challenging practice exam question and it provides full answer explanations and in unique fe features, like it has that score projector to show how you are predicted to score on the real exam. And then the next one listed on there is the actstudent.org, which is the official online ACT study guide. We also recommend that all high schoolers and even our middle schoolers take advantage of those daily questions. Anyone who has a smartphone or tablet, download the College Board's daily practice for the SAT app. It's really a great way to keep those skills sharp each and every day. Another free website is the Khan Academy. The SAT teamed up with the Khan Academy to offer free practice programs. And then Tutor.com Military. It's a tutor program and active duty military members and their families have free access to it. Included in your packet of resources is some more information on ways that you can help your student with test taking, and there are also some tips for your students. Let's now talk about portfolios. So we highly recommend that you start 
a portfolio, preferably when your student is already or in middle school, at the latest when they are in high school. Get them into the habit of keeping all the important school paperwork in one convenient place. The portfolio can be an accordion file, a notebook with pockets, or a three-ring binder. Choose whatever works best for you. A portfolio is really a great way to organize important information. And keeping a portfolio is really helpful when you're moving and especially helpful when you're moving mid-year. We recommend that your student keeps the portfolio up to date and that you take that binder with you when you move. So you literally hand carry that portfolio with you. And when you go to the new school, you will have all that information with you when you need it. Since the portfolio creates an overall picture of your student, you can also use it for college fairs or even if your student wants to get a job as a summer hire. Also, portfolios are really helpful when you fill out applications for those colleges or for those scholarships or financial aid because you will have all the information that you need at your fingertips. You just open the portfolio and you can just write down all the information. And this is just a brief overview of what to put in a portfolio. So you should put into your portfolio the student's personal information and academic information, like the transcripts, test scores, personal accomplishments, like awards, leadership positions. Of course, include all extracurricular activities, volunteer hours, and for pay work experience. Your letters of recommendations go in there, and of course, your essays. A list of the portfolio layout is also contained in the resource packet available to you for this webinar. And we're actually going to present a webinar on middle school and high school transition portfolios on Wednesday, April the 5th, where we will get into a lot of detail about how to organize and use the portfolio to your students' advantage. So now we are going to watch a short video that will give some helpful tips for students in grades 8 through 12. And at the end, the video mentions the Chart Your Course package, which can be purchased from the MSEC store online. As students enter their 8th grade year, they are likely beginning to show more and more signs of independence. It is also an important time for parents to know when to step in as caring advisors, particularly for military and veteran-connected youth, and help them make thoughtful and informed choices with regard to course selection throughout their middle and high school years. The Military Child Education Coalition offers the Chart Your Course program for students in middle school through high school graduation. By following these guidelines, students have an excellent chance of graduating on time, even when they've experienced multiple moves. This will also help students develop a strong college application or resume for life after high school. The most important recommendation I can make is for all students to take the most rigorous courses that they can handle. Before we take a closer look at course selection, it's a great idea to consider advanced placement, international baccalaureate, or dual credit opportunities if your child's school offers them. These programs have been proven to increase the likelihood of college admission and in some cases earn students advanced placement or credit at the college level. Have a conversation with your child, their teachers, and counselors to determine if they are good candidates for the added academic rigor. When selecting English courses, look for options with a strong base in literature and composition. These courses will develop the strong reading and writing skills that college will require. Math should find its way into your schedule every year. Target finishing Algebra 1 by 9th grade and be certain to include geometry and pre-calculus before you graduate. For social sciences, U.S. and world history courses are a must. 
you may want to consider government and economics too. Science course selection should include biology, chemistry, and physics. Try to take a foreign language course for a minimum of two years. An appreciation of the arts and scheduling classes like music, theater, and humanities helps students learn the importance of self-expression. Finally, become as computer literate as possible. Look for course selections from introduction to commonly used programs to more advanced concepts. Encourage your kids to participate in extracurricular activities and look for community service and leadership opportunities. Remind them about time management when you see them struggling with deadlines. More than anything, be supportive. Help your student remain positive and realize that challenges are an important part of the learning process. The best tip I can offer parents of military and veteran connected youth is to be flexible and plan ahead. If a move is in your future, Communicate with your child's current school and the school they will be attending and be a vocal advocate to ensure that the transition is smooth. Start with the Military Child Education Coalition's Chart Your Course program or similar resources that help you track academic progress. This is the time to help your student understand that the academic choices they make today can help open doors of opportunity in the future. We hope that the information we have given you today is useful in helping your student graduate on time in spite of multiple moves and at the same time we have given you information on how to ensure that your student stays competitive and has options at the end of high school. Our role as parents is always very important but it's especially important during our students middle and high school years. One of the most important things we can do is set expectations. Children live up or down to the expectations we set for them. And at the same time, it is very important to set expectations that are, are realistic for your child. Remember that you are your child's best guidance counselor. You know your child best. You know what they are capable of. And you can guide them in the coming years as they go through the upper grades and embark on life after high school. We would like to thank the, you all for joining this webinar today and we really appreciate your participation and your thoughtful questions. Following the presentation, you're going to receive an invitation to take a short participant survey that we mentioned in the introduction. And we use this tool to make ongoing improvements to our webinar series, add new topics of interest, and provide feedback to our funders. Please take the two or three minutes necessary to complete the survey. And if you missed one of our previous webinars, or especially if you would like to share this session with your neighbor or with your student, the recordings can be found on our website www.militarychild.org. We would also like to invite you to take part in our many online professional development institute opportunities. Please check out militarychild.org for more information. Please friend us on Facebook and follow MSEC on Twitter. If you're interested in getting a certificate of completion and additional CEU credits, please complete our online survey and afterwards complete the short topical quiz. It only has five questions and you will need a passing score of 80%. You will get a link to the quiz after you complete the survey. Then follow the instructions to receive your certificate of completion. CEUs may be purchased through the MSEC registrar following the successful completion of the topical quiz up to one year from the date the certificate of completion is awarded. All certificates of completion must be validated by the MSEC registrar before CEUs may be awarded. And the CEUs for MSEC parent webinars are awarded through the International Association of Continuing Education and Training. Certificates of completion 
or CEUs are only available for webinars presented on or after February 8, 2017. If you would like to receive a webinar survey for a pre-recorded webinar presented on or after February 8th, please contact Brittany.campus at militarychild.org. We would like to give a special thanks to the Navy Child and Youth Education Services again for making today's webinar possible. And now we are going to unmute our webinar so you can ask us any questions or discuss any topics with us live. Please mute your microphones if you do not wish to comment so that we don't get too much feedback from the system. Does anybody have any questions? Um, we had one question in regards to the Interstate Compact on Educational Opportunities for Military Children. One student or one participant in particular wanted to know about um, weighted transfer credit evaluations between districts and how she can best use MIC-3. Do you have any suggestions on that, Katja? I know that we have an upcoming webinar on MIC-3 this summer, so we definitely